has been uh, very nice to show up tonight and be with us and share some, share some thoughts with us. Uh, I had told everybody on a variety of different venues that his talk would start at 7.15, so it's very possible that some others are going to get here at about that time. The congressman has a very tight schedule, and he's got to be out of here by 7.45, and that's why we're kind of tight here. At any rate, uh, the congressman was elected first in 2010. He did not become our congressman until 2012 after it was redistricted, and we fell into his congressional district at that point in time. Uh, I met the congressman already at, at a variety of different venues over the last two years. So he was really at the Heart of Thon, he was at the Boys and Girls Club uh, dinners for a couple of years. Uh, and I can truly say that Congressman Gibson is the type that makes friends very quickly. I befriended him. Uh, we have a nice relationship, and it's very comfortable for me to be here and introduce him. And with that thought, Congressman Gibson is the Les, thank you very much. Uh, great to be with you uh, this evening. And, you know, let me just uh, begin by uh, expressing uh, my appreciation to Rotary. Uh, what a huge difference uh, that you make. And I'm saying that from the vantage point of a former commander who uh, led troops in Haiti uh, after that devastating earthquake uh, in January of 2010. You know, we were sent to, uh, sent to Haiti. Uh, the president sent us there to immediately to try to help with the uh, search and rescue, and then uh, thereafter for the humanitarian relief operations. And, uh, you know, it was a very, very difficult set of circumstances down there, but, you know, Rotary made a difference. When uh, when you sent those shelter boxes there, uh, you helped us. You helped us. Uh, there was major concern about a immediate breakout of disease, and uh, the shelter boxes played a part in uh, protecting the people of Haiti. So, and I just I want to say that, first of all, thank you. And then to say, just more generally, that uh, for the folks who join Rotary, you know, I, I, uh, I find Folks that are just committed to helping others, public servants, community community oriented servants, and yeah, I think that Les he just mentioned the times that I run into him. Whenever I run into him, he's always helping somebody else. So you know, I, these are the kind of things that make our country stronger. So when I heard about this uh, opportunity to be with you, I was excited to accept and, and to be with you. I'm sorry that I can't stay longer. I do have another event in New Paltz this evening, but we have some time here. And you know what I want to. You know, I, I think it's a it's a natural transition to talk about the theme that I want to uh, really highlight this evening, and that is service, and how important I think that is. You know, you think about the state of our country today, and it, you turn on the news and you hear about somebody in Hollywood or some other place that seemingly has it all. You know, very wealthy, uh, all kinds of material goods, lots of fame, and yet there seems to be something missing. I mean, this is a very restless age, I think, for our country. Uh, so many folks seeking meaning, trying to understand, you know, how they can make a difference and how they can really find uh, rest in their soul, happiness in their soul. And, you know, for me, uh, I think it's right in front of us. I think it's right there out in front of us. It's, it's service. It's a life committed to helping others and to making a difference. And you think of that warm feeling you get whenever you uh, you help somebody. I mean, there's a description for that. That's called euphoria. And it's really that connection with God. And uh, so, you know, I, I commend you. I mean, you, you, if you're in Rotary, you get that. And I think it's I think it's important that we do what we can uh, to try to inspire others uh, to pick up um, that sense of, uh, of mission. And I think that'll make us a stronger country. And I think it'll also make us a, a happier country. And, you know, um, you think about the state of uh, you think about the state of uh, governance today. You think about the state of politics, and there too there are significant challenges. You know, I don't get it often. Often do I uh, not often do I get a chance to actually turn on the TV, but but when I do, I seem bombarded with negativity. You know, there's all this talk about divide in our country, and that sometimes is followed with decline, and and uh, I don't believe any of it. I'll just tell you that I don't see this as, um, you know, as somebody who, over the course of my military career, I guess I was in about uh, three dozen different countries. You know, when I uh, 
You want to see Dubai. You want to see places like Iraq. You know, in, in one province in Iraq, in Nineveh province, uh, where I spent a couple tours, you know, in that province, there were Sunni, Shia, Kurds, Turkmen, Yazidis, Zoroasters, Christians, Jews, Chaldeans, all in one province. All in one province. And, you know, uh, they often would want to talk about the last 2,000 years. We were just trying to get through the end of the day. And, um, you know, we were able to help bring people together. And thanks be to God, uh, you know, that, that war is behind us in Iraq. It's not going to be a uh, Jeffersonian democracy. I don't mean to uh, communicate that. Uh, but, you know, I will tell you that your servicemen and women, you know, they went forward and did what you asked them to do. And, you know, so when people talk about divide in our country, I don't see that. I see unity. You know, I see unity. We have so much more in common than we ever have apart. And I think when we recognize that, not to say we don't have spirited debate, because we do. That's, I think that's actually a good thing in a free society. It's, it's uh, you know, the fact that at the end of that debate, we need to come together. And we need to find a way to move forward together. So what am I doing about that in the Congress? <laughs> well, I'm a leader in a group called No Labels. I don't know if you've heard about it yet, uh, but you can learn more about it. If you go to nolabels.org, you can see the website. This is 94 members of Congress, and we're in both parties, evenly split between uh, Republicans and Democrats. We're mostly in the House, but not entirely in the House. Uh, there's about 10 senators that are with us. And, you know, our fu we believe our mission is uh, to restore functionality to the Congress. And I'm going to give you a report on that. Uh, in a moment. But I want to tell you where it started. It started first with just building trust. You know, being with each other, sharing meals, getting to know each other, getting to hear more about each other's families, talking about what's important to our respective districts, to build trust. And so just to illustrate this point, you know, down in Washington, when we meet, the first full day, because we come down and we have about <coughs> half day, we, we do voting on suspension. This is usually either Monday or Tuesday. And then the next day is the first full day of legislative work. On that first full day, the respective parties meet. They have partisan caucus meetings. And what's interesting about that is when Republicans and Democrats meet, you know, they you can often read the results of that meeting in the media. <laughs> now, how, wrong, how wrong is that, right? You know? Now, here's the, here's the interesting juxtaposition. These no labels meetings we've had, our discussions are much more sensitive because you're actually talking about compromising and getting stuff done, and we've never done that to each other. We've always trusted each other, and I think that's really important. I, I find encouragement in that. Number one. So what have we done in terms of uh, substance? Well, let me say this: that in uh, in significant measure, because of our work of no labels, you know, we were able to influence and get the first. Uh, enacted federal budget in five years. And that was really important to do. Now you're probably thinking, what do you mean? First time in five years, you guys should be doing it all the time. And I would agree with you on that. And I've been an advocate for uh, us to get back to basic uh, regular order, doing routine things routinely, getting budgets done. But it was important that we get it done. And so how did we do it? Well, no labels, we had a bill, and it was a pretty simple bill. I think you'll relate to it. It was no budget, no pay. You don't get a budget done, you don't get paid. So, yeah. so you know, that, so in that, and the president signed it. We, we passed it in the House, and we passed it in the Senate, and the president signed it. And that, um, so we ended up with the first budget uh, in the Senate in four years, and that set the conditions for the House and Senate to compromise. That's what led to the Ryan Murray budget that we signed last uh, December. And look, is it everything that, uh, that that everyone wanted? Of course not, right? We had to work together to get that done. But here's why it was important. Number one, uh, it was important to stability of government operations. Number two is to provide more certainty to the underlying business environment. And number three is we needed to replace the sequester. You know, we had, uh, that sequester was adversely impacting our domestic priorities right here in Sullivan County. Uh, you know, you talk about Head Start, research, um, you know, any, any number of different priorities that sequester was adversely impacting it. The second thing was national security. 
Uh, I'm an advocate for thinking and acting differently, and then you can go through comprehensive, in my view, comprehensive national security reform, and you could be safer for less money. But the sequester was not the way to do that. That's why it was important that we actually come together to enact together a budget. So no budget, no pay uh, helped us get to that point, and it's a two-year budget, so it's helping us not only close out from last year, but for this year. So restoring some functionality by getting a budget. The next thing it was, uh, you know, we had a bill, I was the author of it, and on the Senate side, Senator Nelson, former astronaut, uh, we had a bill that deals with the respective software services that provide for our veterans. Now, uh, in this day and age, uh, you would think that the DOD, the Department of Defense, and the VA's software systems would be compatible, but they're really not, uh, which is a problem, right? And let me make, let me boil this down for you and make it and make it real for you. So, it, one of the challenges that our uh, veterans have when they come home is they have been through all kinds of stress, uh, and so as part of dealing with that in everyday life before they came back home from the service they've had to go for consultations. And that has, of course, you can imagine the medical record is pretty substantial, right? And so, you know, when they leave active service and they come back home to the community, and then they show up in the VA, and the VA says, well, we're gonna have to go through your, med your history, your medical history. Think about, think about, just for a moment, put yourself in the shoes of somebody who's poured their heart out about where they've been in the last anywhere from six to 36 months. You know, and now, now you're telling them you have to do it again. You know, and uh, for some of them it's too much to bear. They just, they just up and walk right out the door. So what we did is we drafted a bill that requires the DOD and the VA to merge their systems and to have one single integrated medical record from the time they raise their right hand to the time they go back to heaven, they would have one, you know, if they serve 30 years, that's great, if they serve three years, and then you know, when they're back home in the community, they would have that one electronic medical record that goes with them that is, helps them with their, uh, with their treatments. So uh, this actually, the lion's share of that language actually was included in the National Defense Policy Bill that the President signed into law at the end of last year. So again, no, uh, no labels, making a difference here in something really important, I think, to all of us. Let me also say that we have a bill now in, uh, that's, that's passed committee on energy efficiencies. Uh, the way that our government uh, purchases energy and so that we can be smarter about the way we use it. So this no labels bill has passed committee. It's gonna save about $4 billion, which is, you know, uh, well, well, it's not a trillion. I mean, it's, it's real money and it's gonna help us. And hey, Mike, how are you? Nice to see you. So, uh, no worries. So, you know, those are three examples where uh, No Labels has made a difference. Republicans and Democrats working together uh, for the betterment uh, of the country. So where are we going from here? So if you go to this website, nolabels.org, you will see the latest initiative we have. And that is trying to unite our country around broad goals that we think will uh, catch the imagination and uh, elicit more teamwork across the country, a national strategic agenda. And you know what we're using as a model is if you think about the 1980s, when we had a Republican president and a Democratic Congress. We had President Reagan, we had Tip O'Neill, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, others in the Congress. Uh, and they certainly had their differences. They, were, they disagreed on a number of things. But they were able to come together and they were able to get uh, tax reform, very important tax reform done and they were able to get important reforms in some of our, uh, our programs. And so they did that by initially fighting and then setting some broad goals that they agreed to and then they committed themselves to finding a way to reaching a compromise. And so that worked in the 1980s. In the 1990s we had a Democratic president and a Republican Congress. Uh, president Clinton and the Republican Congress. They fought too. And then they finally said, you know what, okay, you know, when President Clinton said, he says, you guys want a balanced budget, he said, I agree. So we're going to agree on that. And once they actually set down goals that they agreed upon, they were, they were able to come together and actually get it done. And we not only got a balanced budget working together uh, in respective chambers and also respective parties, we got a surplus. So, you know, with that as an inspiration, this is what No Labels is trying to do now with the National Strategic Agenda. 
And so what are those goals that we think all Americans can rally around? Well, the first one has to do with opportunity and, and job creation. Uh, we have a very ambitious goal that we're looking for over the next uh, decade. We'd like to grow 25 uh, million jobs in our country, including 2 million in the manufacturing sector. And why is that important? Well, you know, as somebody who's the son of a mechanic from Otis Elevator in the building trades, you know, when you want to talk about dealing with income inequality, which I think is very important to the, uh, to the American dream, you know, to me, I think one of the best ways to address that is actually to have that manufacturing come back to the United States. And I believe it can happen. You know, there are examples, there, there are examples right now in our district where we've, we had a, a company that uh, makes uh, ultra capacitors. Uh, it's like an energy drink for anything, you know, wind turbine, uh, bus, uh, Xerox machine. And this, this ultra capacitor was being manufactured in Japan about four years ago. And it's actually now being manufactured in Oneonta. So four years ago, 100 people in Japan manufactured this. Today, about uh, a little over 50 manufacture it in Oneonta. So you can see on the one hand, well, you know, that's not 100 jobs, it's true, but we didn't have any of those jobs, now we have over 50. And how do we do it? You know, we did it with robotics in a, in a motivated, dedicated, trained workforce. So, you know, getting those manufacturing jobs, why do I think that this is so important? Well, number one is it's important for our, our independence to be a self-reliant nation, but it's also important because who occupies those jobs? People, people who generally make $65,000 to $80,000 a year with benefits and some kind of pension, we're talking about the middle class. So, you know, when we focus on job creation and we focus on manufacturing jobs, we think this is going to make us a more uh, independent nation, a more flourishing nation, and a nation that addresses uh, wages. We want to see wages continue to uh, rise. So we think this is something that, regardless of what party you're in, or where you are on the ideological spectrum, that you'd want to rally around this this goal of 25 million jobs and 2 million uh, manufacturing jobs. The next is energy. You know, we have, as a guy who served in uniform for many years and spent a lot of time over in the Middle East, you know, the, uh, we need to be an independent nation, and we can be. You know, this is a frustrating issue for me because oftentimes in Washington, you're expected to, uh, if you're a Republican, you're supposed to be into one side, one type of energy. If you're a Democrat, you're in another type of energy source. You know, to me, uh, why not all? Why, why, why is it that we can't at once drive down gas and oil heating prices for hardworking families and small businesses right now who are paying too much, uh, like this winter, paying too much? And why can't we also be the country that drives down the cost for photovoltaics, that gets photovoltaics uh, competitive with, with, so that it's competitive with any other energy source? And I'm actually optimistic that we can do this. Why? Because we're using some of the same approaches and indeed some of the same engineers that brought us the iPhone and the iPad. And we did that through nanotechnology coatings and composites. And for renewable energy, for solar energy, we're also talking about substitute materials for the gold and silver that's, using, that's used now for manufacturing. So you know, we're using some of those same engineers who are now turned and focused on renewable energy. And we're looking at nanotechnology coatings and composites and substitute materials. And we have a very ambitious goal to drive down the total cost of solar power down to nine cents per kilowatt hour. Yes, that's ambitious. But if we're able to do that, it's going to transform the way that we produce, convey, and consume energy. And it's going to help the working class too, you know, in terms of the ability to drive down their energy. If you think about how often you recapitalize your roof, how often you reshingle, uh, you know, this is something that about every 25 years or so. And if the next time, you know, maybe years didn't last that quite that long, right? but, uh, <laughs> but uh, at 20 to 25. Uh, but you know, if you were able to reshingle and have the ability to have, and, and by the way, we have some of this technology now. It's just very expensive. So that's part of what um, you know, manufacturing and installation can do is drive down the cost. Well, if we're able to do that, think about what that will do for a working class family that can take care of their leaky roof and also have an ability to drive down their their monthly energy costs. So, you know, this is why when I tell you that for no labels, you know, we're looking at job creation and energy independence. And we think that's something that we can all rally around. And then the next is a balanced budget. Uh, you know, we, we've set uh, uh, 20 years for that pace, and but I will tell you this, if we grow, if we grow, we're going to get there quicker. And we can grow. Why can't we? Of course we can grow. You know, if you think about um, the end of the Second World War, 
our debt to GDP ratio, our deficit then, was actually more uh, severe than the one we're dealing with now. And yet we were able within a decade to get that under control, and we did that largely through growth. We also did that through some decisions with regard to how we were going to spend our money, to be sure, but we did it largely through growth. Uh, if you think about it, when the demand in the world went up for goods, what was one of the countries that wasn't destroyed? You know, we had uh, a manufacturing base, we had an ability to provide those goods, and that helped us at that time. But, it, but um, when you look at today, if we have significant economic growth, you know, we're going to be able to get back to that balanced budget. Well, why is it so important? Well, it's important for this reason. You know, it's important because future generations, we want them to have the same choices and freedoms that we've had. And we don't want them to be saddled with a mountain of debt where they don't get the same choices and freedoms because what they're doing is they're paying off, they're servicing the debt that, that we left to them. So, you know, this is why this is also a goal for, for no labels. And then we also look at our, uh, our programs and make sure they're healthy over time. Uh, over a 75 year period. So when you look at uh, the issues that are facing us as a country, what we want to do with no labels is we want this country to rally around the goals, knowing that we're still going to debate and even have spirited the debate how to get there, but if we agree on the goals and we commit, if we commit to saying we're going to find a way to work it out, then I believe we will. And what we need is leadership to get us there. We need leadership to get us there. So, you know, I, I want to tell you that I feel that's my responsibility uh, is to make a difference on this score. And as far as leading by example, you know, I mean, this actually gets to the other piece of this. I mentioned real issues that we're struggling with. There's also another issue, and that is the ability to believe it all. You know, to get our country back to the point where we believe we, we believe that we can do this. And so, I do believe leadership is going to be a part. Uh, it's going to be a necessary piece of this as well. So what am I doing about it? Well, number one, uh, I've self-imposed term limits. You know, I, I am not there for uh, to be a career politician. I've said the most I'll serve is eight years in the United States Congress. I also believe that that was part of what the founders intended. That we were never intended to have a political class. We were intended to have citizens that came forward, served us for a period of time, and then went back to the community. If you look at the Articles of Confederation, we actually had rotation of office <coughs> in the Articles. We, we, dropped it when we went to the Constitution, but remember President Washington self-imposed term limits, right? He did that because he said nobody was meant to be in there for, forever. So, I mean, I'm doing that uh, for our family. We uh, voluntarily give back our pension that I earned in the United States military back to the U.S. Treasury because I recognize I have to make some hard choices. They're not easy. Nobody wants to make uh, decisions, hard decisions with, that could potentially impact and cascade, but if we're going to do this right, if we're going to get the right decisions on growth, the right, right decisions to get us back to a balanced budget, I recognize I could be in a tough place on that, so I want to be the first one to lead by example. And that's why we give our, our pension back to, uh, to the Treasury. I sleep on the, the floor of my office, not for no other reason to tell you that, you know, I basically work. When I'm in Washington, D.C., you know, I'm there to work. So I finish work about 11 or, or uh, 12 p.m., and I, I have a little single bed, I throw it on my floor, and I sleep there, and I get up in the morning, and uh, get a workout, get a shower, and I'm, I'm back working again. And, uh, you know, um, but I think the larger point is this, is that I'm trying to demonstrate with my actions that we can do this. We can come together, and uh, we, we absolutely can solve problems that seem very difficult, and we can uh, advance the common good where this will be our best interest our best century yet, and any talk of decline would be absolutely abject and wrong. Now, in addition to that national leadership, uh, I'm also highly focused on local issues. So, you know, what that means here is we put an office, a congressional office here in Sullivan County, uh, working to, uh, to create jobs. The, the farm bill that we, uh, that we enacted, I think, is going to be good for Sullivan County, help dairy, help fruits and vegetables. You know, the president of SUNY uh, Sullivan is already looking at that. We've, we've, we've got the REAP program in the Farm Bill that helps specifically Sullivan and Warsing and uh, for Southern Ulster County. So, you know, that, that I think is going to help us going forward. It's, it's one of many pieces for Sullivan County. Uh, we've got this uh, real possibility for family resorts, and we're very excited about that, about what we think that could mean for the revitalization of something that's in the fabric of this county. And really, this county led the way on this in our country, and I'm excited about the future on that score. Uh, infrastructure. Uh, we got a, a decent um, uh, surface transportation bill two years ago. 
and we're working on getting an even better one uh, this year. And I think that's really important. We have roads and bridges that need work. We have water and sewer issues. Uh, and that service transportation bill is going to help us. And, and speaking of transport, uh, our infrastructure, so I was with some leaders in Monticello today and listening to uh, some of their ideas. And here's the point. You know, one of the reasons why we sold this idea of family resorts was it could be a game changer. It could be a game changer. Well, part of a game changer means revitalizing the region, the, uh, the specific area around the family resort, and the county and the region. So to do that, we're talking about comprehensive plan. We're talking about uh, first-rate uh, first rate facilities, uh, town halls, um, community centers. We're talking about uh, roads. We're talking about storefronts that are back open again. Um, this is all important because if we're going to sell this uh, concept of Sullivan being the place to go for family resorts, when, when they leave the family resort and go out to Monticello, Liberty, to the surrounding area, you know, we want them to have the experience that's emotional. So when they go back home, wherever it may be, in the 50 states and then around the world, that they will remember in the daily grind of their hard work, they'll say, yeah, but in six months I'm going to get to go back. You know, and they'll come, keep coming back. But it, it, just, it can't just be the family resort. It's got to be world-class facilities all throughout. And so I appreciate that conversation that's ongoing here in the county to address that. I do believe there's a federal and a state role on that, uh, that we can work together in assisting that. And you know, part of it was uh, even the streetscape. This was a, an area where our office was helpful in writing letters of support. And it may seem small, but just little things like that, We're helping with uh, sidewalks, and um, lanterns and things like this can help beautification and functionality uh, within the municipality and help us to be uh, an area where we can have growth. Lyme disease. This is a public health scourge. It's a major issue area throughout uh, upstate New York. Our office is uh, highly focused on this. Uh, work to get resources for a better test. How can it be that a country as great as ours and we don't even pick up half the cases of Lyme? We have to do better on that. There is some reason to be encouraged. Uh, we've got a couple tests that look promising so that we would be able to have an earlier diagnosis. It is a fact that the medical community is divided on whether or not the chronic Lyme exists. Uh, but one thing the medical community does agree upon is the sooner you diagnose it, the better chance of a full recovery. Uh, I listen to constituents all the time who are suffering, long time suffering, so for me, this is a reality. There is no debate. I mean, we have constituents who are suffering from chronic conditions and they've been having them for some time. So, and I'm trying to make a difference on that. And one of the ways we're gonna do that is we have a new bill that we've introduced, a bipartisan bill, and it looks promising uh, for, for passage. And I, how I think it's gonna help is, it will help with the guidelines that address Lyme disease. And why those guidelines are important uh, is because you know, the way that the guidelines uh, read now from the Centers for Disease Control, they're very narrow. And that leads to treatment protocols that are very narrow. And that's part of the reason why we're challenged. And the other piece of this is that the insurance companies, you know, when I asked them, why aren't you paying for uh, some of this care? They said, well, you know, if it was approved care, then we pay for it. See, that's why we've got to get the guidelines changed. So to get the guidelines changed, we, we, in this bill, uh, what we're addressing is uh, requiring the NIH to have a plan uh, to deal with uh, gaps in funding, and then to have working groups for chronic conditions, including chronic Lyme, that include patient advocates and their medical uh, professionals to be part of the group that helps to decide where this research is going, uh, this research money is going. Now, why that's critical is this, is that when I pin down the CDC and say, why aren't you expanding the guidelines? How come you don't do that? They say, well, if the research pointed to it, then we would do that. And the problem is, is when we get research, it's hard to get it published. Because as you know, I mean, that research, before they decide whether or not to publish it, it's sent anonymously for a review. And if it gets a thumbs down, it doesn't get published, and that's part of the challenge that we're dealing with. And so that's why this bill, we think, is going to make a difference, and we're focused on that local issue. Heroin epidemic. These numbers, we've never seen these numbers before. It's very serious. And, uh, you know, I know this county has got a special task force on it. We've convened a meeting. Uh, across the 11 counties, that's the 19th Congressional District, and we shared information, best practices, and uh, I would tell you too that we've gotten this broken down into three basic areas. It's about prevention, it's about enforcement, and it's also about treatment, and we have to address all three areas. We just, I was an author of an amendment that just passed on the House of Representatives, was included in the appropriations bill that increases the funding 
for our task force, for our law enforcement task force, and there's much more to be done. But that was uh, that was included. And then finally, casework. And, and this is, uh, you know, we help veterans, we help senior citizens, folks of any generation that need that advocacy with the federal government. So, you know, I'm just saying here tonight, if you know somebody who needs that help, uh, please reach out to us because, you know, we are here to serve you. So let me just close with this uh, by saying that, you know, uh, I'm optimistic. I, I do believe this. I, I think that we, uh, that, that when we focus on, on the things that unite us, and when we focus on the basics like uh, job creation, uh, and you know, we will uh, we will see policies that not only lead to a flourishing form of life, but I also believe this: when we're growing, we fight less as a people. You know, and when we're not growing, you know, then we have more social strife. So I think that when we focus on the positive, when we focus on pro-growth policies, I think that that is uh, something in all our interest and something that can unite us. And I and I would hope that you know, all of us would be up for that challenge uh, going forward. So thank you for this opportunity to be with you.